Um, we've both experienced pretty rapid rises over the past sort of 12 to 18 months. Where we are now in October 2023, how do you assess, I guess, our current monetary policy settings? All right. Well, I, I would say it's actually somewhat different between the US and Australia. So I'll start with the US because that's what I spend most of my time focused on. The portfolios I manage are predominantly US assets. Um, so the US monetary and, and economic dynamics a bit a bit more in my wheelhouse. So we'll start with that one. There is this perception in the media and as communicated by the Fed that somehow inflation is still too hot or way too hot, uh, as they characterized it a month, only a month or two ago. Um, but I'm going to suggest something different. And I think many of our listeners probably haven't uh, looked at U.S. inflation this way, uh, but I'll try to make it simple. The way we measure inflation in the United States is the consumer price index, the CPI basket. And typically, policymakers focus on core CPI, so price uh, rises x food and energy, which tend to be more volatile. But really, consumers experience headline CPI. So when the whole consumption basket is going up, we're in inflation. And when the whole consumption basket is not rising, we're not in inflation. Here is the kicker. About 30% of the CPI basket is housing costs. And the way we measure that is owner equivalent rent, which is a really quirky concept, and rent of primary residence, which is straightforward. How much rent are people or folks paying for shelter as a service in the economy? However, these two measures of the cost of shelter as a service are very lagged. So in CPI, Primary rent of residence and owner's equivalent rent actually reflect simplistically what happened in the economy more than a year ago. So this is part of the reason why, in my opinion, the Fed missed the initial run-up in inflation because the whole basket, as measured by the data, reflected a, a tranquil rent market from a year gone by, but now we've come full circle. So rent inflation in the United States, as measured by these two laggy categories in CPI peaked in December of 2022. That was the fastest month of rent inflation as measured. But in the open economy, rent growth peaked in 2021 as measured by the fastest month of rent growth. So effectively, the whole CPI basket in the US is fairly accurate in measuring contemporaneous price changes, except for shelter. Shelter is just reflecting a year ago. So let's look at the whole basket X shelter and all items less these two housing components on a three month, six month and 12 month annualized rate of inflation, all of them are below target. And the wow. three month and six month uh, annualized inflation rates, X housing started declining right after the Fed started hiking rates. And the sequential rates of, of, of all items X housing have been declining ever since, which is exactly what's supposed to happen. And so through that lens, inflation is already below target in the U.S. And if the trends continue, it's going to disappear altogether. So um, I do feel that the monetary policy framework in the U.S., which is a combination of the five and a quarter uh, to five fifty policy rate and active quantitative tightening, is actually sufficient to snuff out inflation. It's it's progressing right on the pathway that it should. Now, turn, That's and, and I don't actually think the Fed should hike again. Uh, we'll probably come back to that uh, later in, in, in the episode. But uh, so just quickly turning to, our, uh, to Australia, because I have less, <laughs> less to say about that. Um, I would say that in, in Australia, it's actually the, the central bank's in a tougher spot because you've had really rapid pass through to the uh, broader economy for the rate rises. And I'll simplistically chalk it up to the fact that uh, mortgages are much shorter. So the interest rate hikes pass through more quickly to the housing market than they have in the U.S. Um, and it's affected consumption. So in, in Australia, consumption doesn't look as good as it does in the U.S. However, the other challenge is that the high frequency measures of inflation in Australia have actually ticked up lately. So I believe we'll get another quarterly uh, release here pretty soon. But um, I actually think that we're going to get more hikes in Australia, uh, and it's probably justified purely on a on an inflation uptick uh, 
which again is in contrast to what we're seeing in the U.S. right now. Not good. Uh, Andrew, Bryce Bryce just bought a house this week, so he doesn't yeah. want to hear... And, and in Australia, unlike the US, we're much more a variable rate mortgage economy yeah. rather than fixed. So that's so, that's not what we, he wants to hear. Bryce, did you do a variable rate? Did you get a little fixed period in the front? No. So, well, we, we actually haven't got the loan yet. I, I just signed the contract yesterday and there's a bit of a settlement period. But interestingly, our mortgage brokers are advising that we don't fix because their assumption is that we're likely to see over the next three years uh, rates pull back more than they do go up into another hiking cycle. But I agree with that. Oh, you agree with that? I do, yeah. And, and because <laughs> Australia, the, the interest rate curve is still upward sloping or, or fairly flat depending on how you look at it, um, it probably should be inverted. So even if the uh, policy rates over the very near term do increase, I don't actually expect long end rates to go up that much, at least not after the upcoming syndication, which I think is later in October, long dated uh, uh, bond syndication. So, so just, just help people explain that because you, you said there that you think uh, Australia does have you know, some of the indicators of inflation are ticking up, but you, you think it's uh, more likely that we see a rate cut than a rate rise. So how, how do those ultimately, two things hang Ultimately. Together? So higher first, and then because, okay. because yeah. that on the policy rate, and then because that uh, further tightening really affects everyone's cash flows who's on floating rate mortgages, <laughs> is going to, it's very likely to snuff out inflation at some point soon and to further restrain consumption. So perhaps perhaps we could be in a little bit of a stagflationary environment, uh, but briefly, because in my view, and I think this, I think this is true in Australia, uh, but definitely my view for, for the US, a stagflation, so for our listeners, meaning a period of zero or maybe a little bit negative growth, but still above target inflation is really difficult to sustain because the consumption basket has already gotten so expensive and wage growth, notwithstanding the narrative to the contrary, has been decelerating. And um, just due to lack of affordability and the fact that when consumption declines, that you usually get a, a round of uh, joblessness, layoffs, and increased uh, unemployment. <laughs> it's, it's, when stuff's already expensive, it's very hard for consumption to continue if if the consumption basket gets even more expensive and remember inflation doesn't mean expensive inflation means expensive and getting more expensive incrementally. So stagflation to me sort of rolls over into a run of the mill recession where inflation kind of disappears and then you get uh, central bank cuts. Um, so if it were up to me, I'd probably take the floating rate mortgage too. There you go. Good, Good to know. <laughs> we didn't think we'd talk about housing no, here, fine. but there, <laughs> there we go. So, Andrew, let's let's get to fixed income because it's a fascinating part of the market today. And uh, conceptually, you know, we, we we have to think of it a little bit differently to, I guess, the stock market. Um, the the way I sort of under uh, I think about it is it's like a a stock and a, a flow problem. So, like, there is a stock of uh, fixed income assets which are uh, you know, not having a great time. I think uh, I was reading this morning that uh, long dated US bonds are in like one of their worst bear markets ever. Uh, s and then the flow, like the new issues of treasuries and, and, and corporate bonds are, are printing yields that are, you know, quite interesting. Um, you know, there's sort of 6% more. Um, and so on one hand, people that owned, that bought bonds a couple of years ago were, you know, are underwater. And then on the other hand, fixed income managers seem to be a lot more popular at parties now because there's a lot more money moving into that space. So I guess uh, before we get into the detail, just from like a, a like a high level and, you know, from your perch as a fund manager inside JP Morgan Asset Management, how are you seeing the fixed income markets today? Well, for the first time in a half a generation, uh, risk-free securities are paying positive real yields. And what that means in English is that you can lend money to the U.S. government 
with no default risk and get paid inflation plus. So the two year real yield right now in round numbers is about CPI plus 3%. So that inflation statistic we talked about, whatever it is in the next two years, even if it's 9%, which isn't gonna happen, you get the 12. So you're guaranteed to make more money than, uh, th than inflation. And that's in stark contrast to our generation, our younger generation of investors who from their teenage years have grown up with money in the savings account being worth less the next day because inflation exceeds whatever the interest rate was and it was commonly zero. So we've had a huge change. So a massive opportunity. So the, the base rate curves, meaning the treasury curve in, in, in real terms is very positive. And in nominal terms, what that means is, you know, four and five handle uh, yields on, depending on the part of the curve for treasuries. And then, and then you add credit spread on top of that for high quality corporates in investment grade or lower quality corporates in, in high yield or emerging market credit. And all of a sudden, 8% isn't that hard to generate. So the portfolios I manage for the, the income strategy, for example, you know, eight and a half, nine percent yield. And you don't have to stretch that much on the risk curve to be able to attain that type of return. And that's equity like returns in the past. So you've had a monumental mm -hmm. shift in the opportunity set. Now, here's the problem. That was kind of true at the beginning of this year. And fixed income managers all over the world, my peers, go out preaching the gospel to the investing community saying fixed income is back. All of a sudden, you can make money in fixed income. And it was a totally rational, well thought out argument. So invest investors invested, and then they lost money because yields kept going up all year. So here's the hard part, or one of the hard parts. <laughs> in fixed income, there's almost no amount of yield that you can have in your portfolio that will prevent your fund from going down in price on a day where yields go up. Yields go up, mm. price goes down. Mm. Even though if you hold a bond fund to the duration of the bond fund, you are very likely for low, low credit risk portfolios, very likely to make an annualized return very similar to the yield on the day you bought it. But the pathway can be somewhat rocky. Uh, so that's a challenge, I think, for our industry uh, to help investors build confidence that when you invest in fixed income, when the return stream as measured by yield spreads looks attractive, you want to be able to close your eyes, put it in your portfolio and not look at it again and be fairly confident that over time you're going to make the uh, loss adjusted yield on the day you bought it. Mm -hmm. So Andrew, you mentioned there that your fund is sort of returning between you know eight and nine percent, which is getting close to that long term equity average, which you you also mentioned. So have you seen a lot of investors, um, you know, moving down the risk curve? How how are you seeing investors constructing portfolios these days? You know, when Ren and I first started investing, the concept of that sixty forty portfolio was was very much a thing, but fast became not a thing over mm. the most recent decade. So how are you seeing um, investors now use fixed income in, in their portfolio? Well, there's a, there's a recency bias, meaning because in 2022, for virtually all of 2022, the 60-40 portfolio didn't work, meaning mm. bonds went down and stocks went down. And that's an extremely painful uh, period of time for investors because it's the antithesis of what the modern textbooks would say, portfolio construction, CFA, the, the MBA, you know, all of the certifications that folks uh, who are professional wealth managers can get, say 60-40 is sort of the base case of how you build portfolios and then you, you go from there. Now, the reason it didn't work is because what I call uh, wrong way correlation. And Wrong way correlation means when the sign of the correlation coefficient between bond prices and stock prices is positive. So even though it feels fine when bond prices and stock prices go up together, that's actually not desirable. That happened today in the US. And really what you want is what I call right way correlation, which means that the sign of the correlation coefficient between bond prices and stock prices is negative. 
And that has been the prevailing uh, sign of the correlation over the last couple of decades, three decades, let's say. And before that, it wasn't. So if you go back to the 70s, it was wrong way correlation everywhere. You know, like bonds and stocks went down together all the time. And there is a school of thought now, after having lived through 2022, that... <laughs> wrong way correlation is here to stay and the 60 40 portfolio is dead i do not believe the 60 40 portfolio is dead regardless of which way i think interest rates are going to go uh, over the near term if we take as a given that we're going to enter a recession either in the us and australia or a global recession at some point the yields will fall because central bankers will respond by cutting rates once job loss increases and ugh, economic human household prosperity declines, there will be zero, zero tolerance for uh, keeping monetary policy super tight, but also inflation is going to disappear. There, there, it, households cannot afford uh, to have to the consumption basket continuing to increase in price unless wage growth continues and you get a wage price spiral. But labor's bargaining power is declining in the U.S. right now, notwithstanding the UPS strike and the UAW strike that's ongoing and the actors and writers strike. Every union is striking and getting wage growth, but unions are such a small portion of the U.S. economy that the economy-wide statistics have had wage growth declining for more than a year. And it's, con it's continuing. We have leading indicators that uh, for wage growth for which the correlation is still quite strong, that suggests wage growth, notwithstanding the headlines to the contrary, is continuing to decline. So we don't have a wage price spiral in the US. We're getting further from it. So um, in response to a recession, central banks cut rates and they will stop QT. And you have right way correlation returning when that happens. So equities generally are overvalued, especially in the U.S. Non-U.S. equities are much more fairly valued. But if, if I have new cash, let's say uh, one of our listeners just, just sold a business. You know, you, you, you built a great product, great business. You just sold it. You've got 10 million bucks after taxes coming to you. And now you have 10 million in cash. What are you going to do? Um, you're going to put some of that money in equities. And you're going to put some of that money in equities when the valuations of equities aren't that great. The expected returns on equities are maybe even lower than they are in bonds now. And in order to protect yourself on the downside, if and when we do get a recession, it now more than ever makes sense to have high quality duration uh, in your portfolio, because if you need it, it's very likely to work. Meaning if your stocks are mm. crashing, you know, bonds are going to work. Mm. So, Andrew, there's a there's a lot to consider uh, in the fixed income markets. I mean, there's a lot to consider if you're investing in any market. Um, and I guess, you know, we've, we've covered sort of the, the headline macro themes, interest rate policies, inflation, and then it then, you know, into some of the intricacies of the fixed income market. We now want to distill that all into sort of how you approach it as a fund manager and your investing philosophy, because you are the portfolio manager of uh, JP Morgan Asset Management's latest ETF to come to the Australian market, uh, the JP Morgan Income ETF or JPIA. So how do you take uh, everything we've spoken about and distill that into an investing philosophy? And then, you know, how do you manage the fund? Well, the things we've talked about so far are primarily macro, and we do very actively manage that particular portfolio from a macro perspective. I want to come back to that in a second, because the income strategy, JPIE, we spend an enormous amount of time trying to, uh, trying to succeed in a simple goal. And that is to give our investors a return stream over time that's very similar to U.S. high yield corporates, but to do it with much less volatility. And in order to achieve that goal, we must achieve genuine textbook diversification. And what I mean by that is, and I mentioned correlation on, the, on, on our episode so far before, but we need risk premium to harvest uncorrelated or ideally negatively correlated risk premium from throughout the global fixed income landscape. 
in order to achieve portfolio level risk reduction through diversification. So if we label this portfolio diversified and all I buy is investment grade credit, high yield credit and emerging market credit, that sounds diversified. I got a lot of different regions and names and, and issuers, but all those things are super correlated. So what we do instead is bond by bond and then subsector by subsector, try to pair up risk premium in fixed income, typically combining corporate credit with securitized products, some of which have credit risk and intentionally some of which don't, so that we can create a portfolio of high yield credit that yields 8% and securitized credit that yields 8% and securitized prepay, pre, uh, prepay uh, risk premium that yields 8%. So I have an 8% portfolio, but the fundamental economic environment that is a threat to one of those sectors is different than the fundamental environment, which is a, a threat to another sector. So that's the essence of, of diversification because I haven't given up any yield, but instead of having a portfolio of 100% high yield corporates, all of which will go down in price when high yield corporates go down in price, we have 20% high yield corporates and 80% other stuff, and yet it yields the same as high yield corporates. Mm. So Andrew, we are going to take a very quick break, but on the other side, we're going to unpack the different parts of the debt market and understand what parts are really exciting you. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're here with Andrew Norelli, Managing Director and a member of the Global Fixed Income Currency and Commodities Group and the Portfolio Manager for JP Morgan Asset Management's latest fixed income ETF, the JP Morgan Income ETF, ticker JPIE. Now, Andrew, your portfolio has over a thousand holdings, which compared to the holdings we have in our equity portfolios is quite significant. You have everything from treasuries to corporate bonds, asset-backed securities. Um, so firstly, a portfolio construction question, why such a large number? And you kind of touched on it there, but is it like equities where, you know, if you get to a point with diversification, the incremental addition of a stock doesn't really contribute to the same level of, I guess, value that diversification delivers? There, yes, there, you can get to a point of diminishing benefits. That's the word. For di diminishing diversification. <laughs> um, but interestingly... A thousand holdings isn't it. So you can get to the point where incremental risk premium don't provide you diversification because they're perfectly correlated with other risk premium you have in your portfolio. And the point is to uh, create sources of yield. So the contribution to yield for our total portfolio come from six major risk premium. Whereas when you look at each sector, like high yield or agency mortgages, there's usually two or three, which dominate it. So we harvest all of them from across the fixed income landscape and the portfolio as a whole has contributions to yield from a much more balanced array of risk premium than any individual uh, subsector. And we do have a large number of holdings and there's a fairly simple answer for that. First, is that from a corporate issuer perspective, corporations have lots of bonds outstanding typically. So like Ford will only have one equity, but dozens and dozens of bonds outstanding. Uh, and that's one reason why individual fixed income securities aren't as liquid as stocks. Like ideally we would have everything in fixed income traded on exchanges, but equities are traded on an exchange because they are liquid and not the other way around. Um, because there are so many fixed income securities, it's difficult to obtain equity-like liquidity in each individual underlying bond. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is that securitized products, by its very nature, gives you loads and loads and loads of QSIPs. So um, you might have a, a, a sponsor of a particular securitized um, a subsector let's say auto loans, for example. And every time that sponsor creates a new securitization that has a portfolio of auto loans underlying it, you get a new ticker, a new set of QSIPs 
for the capital structure of that particular uh, trust, for example, that issues the securities. And so there is a proliferation of QCIPs. Now that can be beneficial as well to the portfolio because I have found that when working with our securitized experts, the portfolio managers who more or less I delegate the security selection to for our securitized uh, allocations within the income strategy, they have proven over time to find genuine mispricings. The, the securitized market has so many QCIPs that uh, a careful, diligent observation of the available bonds in the market will, will genuinely uh, offer opportunities that are mispriced. And so that's a benefit to our investors, even though it, it, it might seem unwieldy that the portfolio has a thousand holdings. The mutual fund, uh, I, I manage two mutual funds in the same style as the JPI ETF, and they each have 3000 QCIPs. And the reason it's more is because they have been outstanding for longer than the ETF. Uh, and just just for people who are unfamiliar, QCIP in the US is like a, a, a nine digit code that identifies like any individual security. So like Apple, the stock has a QCIP, but then like every Apple bond that's issued has its own QCIP as well. Is that is that correct? Have I got that right? Yes, Alec, thank you. Um, sorry for the jargon there. No, that's all good. That's all good. So I guess, um, you know, like you're, you, you've mentioned a few different categories of uh, fixed income, uh, corporate bonds, um, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, and then so, some of the other ones, you know, asset backed securities, you know, there might be a whole bunch of car loans that have been put together into a securitized product or for people that have watched the big short, you know, mortgage backed securities, um, a whole lot of mortgages are put together and into a securitized product. Um there, there's like there's a range of different uh, I guess subsections in the fixed income market. You mentioned there uh, some of your analysts are uh, finding mispriced opportunities from just bottom up doing the work, crunching the numbers, and, and finding good opportunities. But I guess from like a to more top down perspective, are there any particular categories that you're finding particularly interesting or exciting at the moment? Right now, because of the rise in treasury yields and generally spreads kind of tight, but not nearly as tight as they got during the QE era, there's opportunities everywhere. And I would say it's securitized products in general. If you, if you compare a securitized bond, let's say a securitized bond that has credit risk, to the corporate bond that has the same default risk, for simplicity's sake, we'll say the same credit rating. I think our listeners know that that's not a, a perfect measure of default risk. But for my explanation, same credit rating in a corporate bond or securitized credit, securitized credit is going to give you more spread. And that's not always the case but it has been the case uh, in, f recently. And so typically because the income strategy is always going to have a mix between securitized and corporate credit, and right now it has quite a bit more securitized than corporate credit, we're like over significantly overweight securitized. Our portfolio actually yields more than high yield corporates right now. And the simple reason for that is that securitized spreads are wider. Mm. So Andrew, to close out our convo today, when it comes to fixed income, it's all about the default risk, of, as you've alluded to. It's, you know, you just don't want to lose money. If a company goes bankrupt, a government defaults or borrowers don't pay back their mortgages or car loans. So how do you approach this risk when there's just more and more financial stress coming through the system for consumers and for companies these days? Well, it's surprisingly still up for debate whether there is financial stress for consumers. I, I happen to be uh, a pretty strong believer, and this is actually more true in Australia than the US currently, but that the consumer is not in great shape. So what we have done intentionally in our portfolio 
is concentrate on seasoned bonds. And that word in American English basically just means bonds that are not new, but have been outstanding for a period of time. And in the securitized space, when you have bonds that are outstanding for a period of time, because of the way the structure works, um, the credit enhancement or credit support, meaning the cushion of the portfolio of underlying loans, the cushion for losses gets thicker the longer the bond stays outstanding. So we've intentionally focused our portfolio on seasoned bonds that have built up a big cushion for consumer loan losses. The second thing we've done is try to keep the duration on the short side. And that's another benefit of securitized products is that they typically have shorter durations, shorter average lives, something like two, three years and they're seasoned. So they, they, they are amortizing, rolling down, or we have better near term visibility on the consumer health uh, and cushion below us to absorb losses. And then the other thing that we have done is when buying new issues, things that aren't seasoned, we have a long-standing relationship with issuers and I would say within JP Morgan, a leadership position in structuring securitized deals where we've been able to modify the terms so that the cushion on new issues builds up uh, substantially more quickly. So when the PM team is sitting on top of the portfolio saying, hey, we're worried about a near-term recession, we need to make sure that the bonds we're buying protect us from a near-term recession or at least that the spread they pay compensates us for the risk that we're taking. That's an important point. Like from a credit risk perspective, which bond is riskier? A bond that trades at 90 cents on the dollar or a bond that trades at nine cents on the dollar? I would argue the 90 is actually riskier. So it does depend on price. Is that, is that just because uh, you've got more to lose if it's trading at 90 cents on the dollar? Or to put it this well, way, then- if you're, a, if you're a benchmarked investor and there is a bond in the benchmark that trades at nine cents on the dollar and you don't own it, you're at way more risk of that thing ripping back higher yeah, yeah. than uh, you, you are owning a 90 cent bond that goes down. Yeah, well, th- let's just load up on high yield then, hey? <laughs> Well, Andrew, look, it's a it's a fascinating conversation. We, we've been speaking more and more about the world of fixed income this year as, you know, every investor and financial media publication has been because, you know, as rates have come back, uh, the, the asset class has certainly come back into focus. And it's great and, you know, we're lucky that we can speak to people who've been focusing on it for the last, you know, you know however many years. So, um we do really appreciate your time and, and you sharing your wisdom. If people want to learn more, uh, they can uh, check out uh, the JP Morgan Asset Management website and the fund uh, that Andrew manages, the JP Morgan Income ETF. The ticker is JPIE. Andrew, thanks for joining us today on Equity Mates. Thanks, guys. Great to be with you. Thanks, Andrew.